Welcome back to Local Decision 2020. I'm Rusty Ray and we're joined now by Representative Connie Bernardi of the DFL, the representative out of District 41A. Connie, thank you for being here. Thank you. It's nice to be here, Rusty. And uh, this is not your first time running, obviously, but this, I would imagine this year is a little different than the others in terms of campaigning and, and trying to talk with people and, and hearing their concerns. What's that been like in this crazy 2020? Well, this whole COVID-19 pandemic has really actually gotten me closer to my constituents because so many more people are reaching out for mm -hmm. concerns around getting their unemployment checks, uh, private um, people that are self-employed, um, housing issues. And so it's been a whirlwind because my favorite part of my job is helping constituents. And so get researchers involved, get state agencies involved and do whatever I can to help so I've been really engaged with the members of our community. Are you hearing from any of them or do you personally feel like uh, addressing the immediate needs of COVID as the state has and has adjusted over the months has it pushed back or delayed anything that you personally were working and making progress on or that you felt like the legislature as a whole was making progress on? Yes that's a thank you for asking that question. Mm -hmm. We have a really important bill at the Capitol mm -hmm. that needed to be passed and that is our capital improvement bill, we call it a bonding bill right. oftentimes. And it's, it's local projects that get people to work and help build our infrastructure, our clean water and things like that. And so it would create many, many jobs. And in the state of Minnesota, we don't get to create money like the federal government does. And we have to balance our budget. We balance our budget every two years. We can't spend more than we take in. And so a bonding bill is one of our only stimulus packages we have and that is something that we should be doing every two years anyway. Mm -hmm. And the fact that it didn't get done is really, really troubling. And we just couldn't get Kurt Dowd, the Republican leader, to get his caucus to um, support it and pass it through the Minnesota House. And so there's no possibility this year because even with special sessions or whatever, the clock is, is what it is on the Yeah, year, right? I think it'd be highly yeah. unlikely if we went back to a special session before the election. So it's super disappointing. People's livelihoods are dependent on these bonding bills passing. Well, as you, you called it a stimulus, and that's, that's a great way to look at it. And yes, it would create those jobs and, and opportunities or, or positions for growth, but it also would address things that people see every day, whether it's the roads they're driving on or programs that they and their families and their kids are involved in. And so that's kind of the tangible things I would imagine that people can see and then say, well, hey, our state house folks are doing what they're supposed to be doing. Is, is that the sense of well, that? Well, exactly. And we need to take good order of our, of our infrastructure. Mm -hmm. And what that means is our universities, the buildings have leaky roofs and we need to repair those. And state-of-the-art um, research facility. We have like one of the best childhood uh, development colleges in the world, actually. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And their facility, I've got, I got to tour it, it is so archaic. And um, that was part of the plan in the bonding bill. So that would just be one example. And then like broadband around the state, that's another example. And then our, our roads and our bridges and our, our pathways and our sidewalks to keep people safe, all those things are on the back burner because uh, we could not get mm -hmm. get it passed, unfortunately. In a look through, uh, in, in getting ready to speak with you, I looked at your website and, and some of your positions on certain things. I did notice a, a note in there, um, you mentioned universities and colleges, a note in there about uh, the cost of, of an education, whether it be tuition itself or, of course, the debt that so many students nowadays are, are really struggling to pay off. What are the things that you have done or that the state can continue to look at doing to help ease that burden? Well, part of it is the state has in statute a commitment to pay for two thirds of a child's education or a person's education mm -hmm. and a third, a third paid for by, by the individual. That's the way it was when I went to school. Mm -hmm. And now it's like barely 50 50. And we have been balancing the budget, not we've been balanced, not me, I'm going to say that, I don't, mm -hmm. I don't agree with it, balancing the budget on the backs of our students. And so they, that's why student uh, tuition has skyrocketed. And I serve as the higher education chair mm -hmm. now, which is quite an honor. Mm -hmm. And what we did is we like fully funded our universities so that they didn't have to balance their books by rising tuition costs. So th through my legislative career, we've been able to freeze tuition and fully fund our schools. There's one thing about saying we're going to freeze tuition and we're going to make the uh, technical schools and universities cut tons of programs and the students right. can't finish their coursework. And there's another thing to fully fund it so that you can have the robust opportunities for students or just even have the ones that they had 
and then um, keep tuition costs down. What about education uh, for the younger kids? What about, um, certainly the attention has been paid to the adjustments that COVID has brought in, in the state's public education and the guidelines and, and adopting new models and families having to make adjustments, but uh, education spending continues to be a topic that everyone is, is looking at, whether it's we need to do more to fund or we need to make sure we're spending that money in a very smart way. What are you hearing and what are you seeing coming up for the state, especially given the, uh, the budget constraints coming into the new session? Well, it's going to be challenging, right. but you know, our budget is like a moral document. It's, it tells the public and the world, what do we value in Minnesota? Mm -hmm. And Minnesota has been a state that values education from the earliest learners to people through college, technical schools, and uh, training throughout their lives. And so we need to, I, we need still to keep that commitment and we're going to have to look at all options on the table on the revenue source and on um, where can we cut back. But education is something that we need to make sure that we have those opportunities for Minnesotans. Staring at the, the new year coming up in the new session and the, the budget process that will that will naturally, as you said, come about. Uh, looking at the way the state brings in revenue and looking at the deficit that is forecasted and is certainly there. Uh, folks across the aisle say no more new taxes, we can't keep doing this, but are there other ways of looking at bringing in that revenue that's needed to help pay for these things to continue or new efforts by the state? It's a challenge and COVID has brought that challenge in this economic sense, but are there ways that the state can continue to find other ways to fund what it needs to do? Well, we're going to have to find all kinds of creative ways to do things. And um, I don't want to take that revenue off the table. We have um, our really ultra wealthy, let, let's just say really ultra wealthy people that we often don't even know in our lives. And let, let's just put 400000 or more a year mm -hmm. earning. They are not paying the proportionately the same uh, percentage of their income as we are, as other people are in um, making less than them. So creating fairness in our, in our tax system wouldn't affect most Minnesotans at all, mm -hmm. but it would help the school opportunities continue, higher education opportunities continue, our road infrastructure and safety. So we need to look at that and also corporate loopholes. There are ways in which we can look at what are we spending and then how are we paying for it. What is 2020 and, and all of the above and, and everything that has happened this year, COVID, racial tensions, things like that, what has that shown about how the state is addressing health care needs and health care issues and maybe if there are more things that the state can do uh, and public safety. A lot of people are concerned about public safety, whether it be defunding and whether that's an appropriate term or mm -hmm. not, but uh, or uh, just basic outreach. Are there other things that 2020 has shown that the state uh, can maybe do differently looking ahead? Well, first of all, I just want to say during this COVID-19 pandemic and the murder of George Floyd, I have been so moved and impressed mm -hmm. by neighbors helping neighbors, essential workers on the front lines, and also of uh, people raising their voices for social justice. So I just wanna give a shout out for all the people that have been coming together to make a difference. And it has, um, our racial disparities through this COVID-19 have really um, have shown their true colors. And people are seeing that people of color are getting more COVID cases and more deaths. And so it's just, it's, it's brought it out to the forefront even more. And it's really important that we address those and we address healthcare for everyone. It's gotten expensive mm -hmm. and prescription drug costs are skyrocketing. And so working on things like we did last session where um, a bill that I was a part of, we actually had price disclosure requirements mm -hmm. for prescription drug companies so that we could help bring down the skyrocketing cost of prescription drugs. So there's so many different things. And another thing we need to do is make sure that people, every Minnesotan can actually get COVID-19 testing. It should not be based on if you have health insurance and if you have enough money mm -hmm. and if you're on Medicare or whatever. So those are some of the things um, that we need to be looking at. And having served in this role for so long, what is it that's unique or what is it particular to your district uh, that you feel like you're able to bring with you to the state capitol, but you also are fighting to represent. Is there, is there anything, is there anything in particular about your, whether it's demographics or, or just the, the layout or the, the geography of it that you feel like you're able to bring to bear and when, when you're there fighting for these things that you've been talking about? Well, thank you for asking that mm -hmm. question because I grew up in our community and mm -hmm. I'm so proud to represent it. And I'm a mom, a wife, 
a worker, I've been a community advocate, and I bring those values with me to the Capitol. And so things like uh, fighting to protect our climate, I'm part of the Climate Caucus. My family and my, my family and live next door to a Superfund site in our community. Mm -hmm. Our, my parents worked at Superfund sites in our community, and so environmental protections is super important to me. And I'm so happy that I've been able to, I advocate fiercely for our community, and I got funding to restore the Springbrook Nature Center right. wetlands, right. which is, people might not know this, but it's a filter, a wetland that mm -hmm. goes into the Mississippi River, where people get their drinking water in the Mississippi River, it gets cleaned out. And then um, also the Springbrook Nature Center facility, it's a $5 million bonding project that I chief authored and we got. So that would be a, one example is how we care about the environment because it has been impacted in our community in negative ways and so that's super important. And then education, growing up in our community, I had the most amazing education and the most amazing mm -hmm. teachers and um, they're, still, they're still around and I still get to see them and um, some support my campaign and that's really fun. But bringing those values of um, making sure that every learner from young to um, college can, that can have a great opportunity to achieve their dreams. And um, just want to share this. I was chief author of the, high, um, mm -hmm. the um, all, K, all day kindergarten free kindergarten mm -hmm. program. I've been able to author legislation to get our youngest learners to have opportunities in our preschools, in our community and then working to hold down tuition and uh, serve as our higher education chair. Yeah, so the higher education piece and then the early childhood, mm -hmm. it's kind of the spectrum there of the needs, but uh, again, showing that the state government and the, the way the state can provide those programs and opportunities mm -hmm. is, is ever present, right? Mm -hmm. That's right. Okay, Connie, we're gonna leave it right there. I appreciate your time today. Well, thank you for having me, Rusty. Okay.